you up. And basically what I did was share my testimony to show that I was trying to please God and earn God's performance by my, uh, I mean, God's acceptance by my performance. And I became a Pharisee. And then God showed me his holiness. And in comparison to God's holiness, man, all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. I repented and thought that God was going to give me what I deserved. And instead of that, I got caught up in the love of God. I enjoyed it. It was wonderful, but I didn't understand it. How could God love somebody like me? And it's not that I'm worse than anybody else, but when you see the holiness of God and the purity of God, all of us at our very best don't deserve anything from God. There's some people in here that disagree with that, and you think that you're really pretty awesome. And all I can say is you just haven't seen the glory of God. If you ever see the glory of God, you'll know that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell? Praise God. <laughs> Man, we all need help. And so I just couldn't understand. I knew that God loved me, but I couldn't understand it. And the Lord showed me that 2 Corinthians 5, 17, when you're in Christ, you become a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. And that's not talking about your body. Your body doesn't change. It's not talking about your soul. It's talking about your spirit. And I functionally was illiterate and ignorant of the spirit realm out here and the spirit on the inside of me. And when God gave me that piece of information, it began to just open up the whole word of God to me. I could spend an hour on this right here, but if you understand the spiritual realm and that you are a new person in Christ, scriptures that have been closed to you will all of a sudden become alive because it's written to your spirit man. And so it began to open up a lot of things to me and it just began to change my whole focus. So what I want to do tonight, I've already made those points that we are a new person in Christ. It's our spirit that has changed. And I want to just go through and start showing you some of the things that God showed me about the spirit. And again, everything I teach, and I've got over 400 teachings that are available on our internet site free of charge. I've got thousands and thousands of hours of teaching and everything I teach comes out of this truth. And so I could expand on this in a lot of different ways. I'm just going to be giving you uh, a few things about this, but I encourage you to open up your heart. And if this touches you and changes you the way that it's changed me, you'll never be the same. It has totally, totally changed my life. So I've already laid this foundation. It's your spirit that's changed. And I didn't say this in all of the services. I forgot which one I said over the weekend, but I made this point. I won't go through the scriptures, but uh, John 6, 63 and James chapter 1 talk about that the Word is spirit and it is life. The Word is like a mirror. It's like a spiritual mirror. If you want to see what your physical body looks like, you can't go by how you feel. You know, some of you, this will be a brand new thought to you, but you've never seen your face. And many of you think, oh, yeah, I have. You've never seen your face. You can't see your face. You've seen a reflection of your face. You've seen a painting of your face, a picture of your face, but you cannot see your face. Some of you have never thought about this. You've never seen your face. And yet, every one of you could describe if you've got moles or wrinkles or, you know, what you look like you, because you see an image and you trust it. How do you know that that image is accurate? <laughs> you know, the first time I ever went to Uganda, right next to the elevator, they had a mirror that if you stood in front of one mirror, it made you tall and skinny. And if you stood in front of the one on the other side, it made you short and fat. I'm sure all of you have seen that. How do you know that the image you're seeing is correct? I'm not trying to get you to doubt what you see in the mirror, but I'm just <laughs> making the point that you take something by faith. You've learned how to adjust to it. Well, the Bible says that this is a mirror. And if you want to see what your spirit's like, you cannot go by how you feel. You can't see your spirit. You can't feel your spirit. The Word is a spiritual mirror, and you have to hold it up and just believe what you see. 
Just as much as you believe what you see in a mirror, you need to believe what the Word of God says about you. So let me share some things that the Word of God says about your spirit man. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, and man, I could, I could spend hours on every one of these scriptures. These scriptures have revolutionized my life, but I'm going to just give you, this is going to be like drinking from a fire hose, and you need to maybe take notes or get materials and go back and study this because there's a lot in this that I'm going to be skipping over. But in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24, it says, and that you put on the new man, which that's talking about the spirit part of you, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. One of the things that just revolutionized my life, I was used to looking on the outside. I knew my actions and I knew my thoughts and I knew my fears, and I knew all of these things. But in the Spirit, it says that you were created righteous and truly holy. This is, every word is important, but you were created that way. You aren't becoming righteous. You aren't earning righteousness. It's not based on your performance. The Spirit part of you, when you got born again, boom, you became the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For he hath made him, talking about God the Father, hath made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You are righteous. And again, I could spend an hour talking about what is righteous, but a little simple layman's definition is you are in right standing with God. It's just as if you'd never sinned. That's what... My definition of justified is just as if I'd never sinned, amen. I'm justified just as if I'd never sinned. In the spirit, there is no sin. There is no inadequacy. You were created. That means that it didn't have anything to do with you. You didn't earn this. It's not based on your performance. You were created righteous and truly holy. You know, when it says truly holy, that's implying that there is false holiness. You know what false holiness is? All of your actions. <laughs> now, I, again, I could minister an hour on this. I'm saying so many things right here. It's it, Anyway, you need two kinds of holiness. You need a physical holiness based on your actions to relate to people. If you were to receive this message and go out of here saying, man, I'm created righteous and I'm truly holy and it doesn't matter what I do. My actions aren't important. So you just get in your car and speed. Cop's going to stop you and you can tell him, say, hey, the preacher just told me I'm righteous and I'm holy. It doesn't matter what I do in the spirit. He says, well, fine. And he'll write you out a ticket and you'll get a ticket. You need physical holiness but, and you need that to relate to people. If you don't treat your mate right, if you don't treat other people right, if you don't, you know, if you go to work tomorrow and say, hey, I heard a guy talk about I'm righteous and holy and everything's good. And so I may or may not come into work. I may or may not work. You know, it doesn't matter. I'm righteous. Well, that's not going to do you any good with your employer. You need a physical holiness, a physical righteousness. If I had time, I could teach on this from Romans chapter 9 and Romans chapter 10. It talks about they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto kind of righteousness. So you need a self-righteousness to relate to other people and stuff. But when it comes to God, your self-righteousness is like filthy rags. It is inadequate. God doesn't deal with you based on your righteousness and your actions. Here's another verse that you put this together with everything I'm going to say tonight. This is one of the things that changed my life. John chapter 4 verse 24 says, God, Jesus was speaking and he said, God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It didn't say that this is the best way. It gets the best results. It says you must do it. There is no other way to relate to God except in spirit and in truth. And once you understand that your spirit is the part of you that was changed, your spirit is created in righteousness and true holiness. 
This is one of the things that just changed my life. I finally understood how Almighty God, who is pure and holy, could love me because he's not loving this physical part of me. He's not loving my soulish part of me that still struggles. He loves the part of me that's born again, that was created righteous and holy. I'm in his class. Some of you choked on that one. But here's another verse that really ministered to me over in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. Look at this one. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, this is talking about Jesus, as He is, so are we. And it didn't say, so are we going to be in heaven. It says, so are we in this world. Now, how do you understand that? See, if you don't understand spirit, soul, and body, if you don't understand that it's the spirit part of you that was changed, you read verses like this and you start saying, well, I've got to be like him. I've got to, I've got to behave more. I've got to do all of this. That's not what this is saying. It's not saying that you should be like him. It says, as he is, so are you. Is there anybody in here who's arrogant enough to think that you are exactly like Jesus in your body and in your mind and emotions? Is there anybody who thinks that you act just... Did you say yes? All right, if you are exactly like Jesus in your actions, and if you love and you have the same mind and the same wisdom, if everything is perfect in your physical body, I want you to stand up. I'd like to meet you. Anybody? See, most people read this and they just, they can't see this. They go look in the mirror and they think this is like Jesus and they see wrinkles and zits and all kinds of stuff and they think this is like Jesus. Or they so search their soul and they think, but I've got fear and I get angry and I'm bitter and I'm depressed and I'm this and I'm that. And they say, well, the Bible's just so hard to understand. The reason it's hard to understand is because you're trying to see these things in your physical body. Your Amen. physical body's not saved. Your soul's not saved. They are in the process of being changed. And to the degree that you submit to the Lord and renew your mind, you can reflect these things in your body. But you still have a body. And that body is flesh. And it doesn't matter if it's USDA choice flesh. It's still flesh. And you are going to fail. You know, I had a friend of mine. He worked for me. And he had been a pastor of a church. And he had something happen that was really bad. He thought his wife was cheating on him, which she wasn't. But he thought she was. And he got mad. And he drove down the road and threw his Bible out the window and said, God, if this is the way, you know, you reward me for serving you, I just quit. And he went and overdosed on drugs. He was a relative of Nicky Cruz. He used to uh, run in the gangs. And that's what he used to do. And so he just went back to what he used to do. And he overdosed on drugs, tried to kill himself. And uh, anyway, he survived. He was in the hospital. And so I went to see him. He didn't want to see me. He left word for me not to come. And I forced my way in. And anyway, when he saw me, he just was so humiliated. He said, how could I have done this? I've seen miracles. God has changed my life. I've pastored a church. How could I have done this? And it, see, he was expressing something that a lot of Christians think. And they think that I'm supposed to be more mature. I'm supposed to be better than this. I'm, I've gone beyond this. I tell you what, your flesh is flesh. And the victory in the Christian life, you don't get your flesh to where it's better. You don't get your soul to where it's better. The victory in the Christian life is to get out of yourself and to quit trusting in yourself and quit going by your own understanding and trusting in God. But the moment you step out of who you are in Christ, your flesh is still flesh. It's just like flying in an airplane. You could be sitting there thinking, man, I'm going five, six hundred miles an hour. I'm 39,000 feet. Look what I'm doing. You aren't doing anything. It's the plane that's doing it. And it's your position in that plane that allows you to do it. And if you don't think so, step out of the plane and see how you fly. 
It's only who you are in Christ, your spirit that was created in righteousness and true holiness. And if you get out of the spirit and if you get in your flesh, you are as capable of doing anything in your flesh as you ever were. Flesh is flesh. Your flesh isn't getting better. But see, this guy thought, I'm supposed to be better than this. And I just told him, I said, look, all you did was get into the flesh and your flesh just went back to doing what your flesh does. But your spirit is still righteous and holy. You didn't lose anything. And it just helped him to be able to step out of that. But see, there's a lot of people that you have had your mistakes, your physical things, your thoughts, your actions. You see that as your identity, but that's not you. The real you is a spirit man that was created in righteousness and true holiness. And according to this verse, it is identical to Jesus as Jesus is so are you in this world. It didn't say in the world to come. It says in this world. The only way you can understand this. See, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, you'll read this and go look in the mirror and think, well, that is not true. And so you just, you lose your confidence in the Bible. But this is talking about the part of you that's in Christ. The part of you that's in Christ is identical to Jesus. I'd love to minister on this, but I'm just going to mention it. First John chapter three, verses eight and nine, it says, whosoever is in Christ cannot commit sin. And people try and explain that as well. This means you won't habitually sin. You'll even see some of the translations that say that. That's not what it's talking about because, you know, did you know that if you're overweight, it's habitual sin? I didn't get a lot of amens on that one. <laughs> Did you know you can't get fat over eating one meal? You could eat until you pass out. You might gain a pound or two. But if you're 20, 30, 40, 50 plus pounds overweight, you habitually sin. Thank you for that thunderous silence. The Bible lists gluttony right next to adultery and lying and stealing and drunkenness. I'm not trying to condemn anybody, but I'm just saying that if you sit there and define habitual sin, you can't get fat. You can't be overweight without habitual sin. So if you're going to say that 1 John chapter 3 where it says, whosoever is born of God cannot commit sin, and you're going to define that as habitual sin, well then a person that's fat couldn't be saved. And that's not true. A person who continually gossips can't be saved. A person who is continually depressed can't be saved. A person who is habitually fearful couldn't be saved. A person who habitually worries couldn't be saved. That's not what it's talking about. The way to understand this, the only part of you that's born of God is your spirit and it can not sin. Your spirit doesn't sin. If you sin, your body sins, and you sin in your mind and in your emotions, but your spirit doesn't sin. As Jesus is right this moment, so are you in the spirit. And it says, I'm just, man, I'm talking as fast as I can. I'm going to quote some of these, and you can go look them up. But 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. The Greek word for one there is hes, H-E-I-S, and it means a singular one to the exclusion of another. It doesn't mean that we're similar, we're parallel, that here's God and here we are in our little human spirit. No, it means we are a singular one to the exclusion of another. Your born again spirit is ounce for ounce, molecule for molecule, if there are those kind of things in the spirit realm, identical to Jesus. Most Christians don't believe that. They think I got a little baby spirit and I got to grow my spirit. I hadn't got time to explain that. But you weren't given a baby spirit that has to grow. Your spirit is identical to Jesus. As Jesus is, so are you. Do you think Jesus is still growing? Jesus is complete. Your spirit's not growing. The part of you that's growing is your mind. I'm not trying to minister to your spirit tonight. Your spirit's perfect. 
Your spirit has the mind of Christ in it. First Corinthians chapter two, verse 16. See, that's another verse that people have a disconnect and they think, I got the mind of Christ and they search this little peanut sized brain up here and, and they think this is the mind of Christ. No, it's not. It's not this mind, it's this mind. You've got a mind in your spirit and you know all things. First John chapter two, verse 20 says that we have an unction from the Holy One and we know all things. See, most people again are carnal and they think only in the physical realm. And so they search their mind and they say, I know all things. You can't even find your glasses and they're on top of your head. And we think, I can't, I don't know all things. What does this mean? It's not talking about your brain up here. It's talking about in your spirit, you have the mind of Christ and you know all things. Your spirit knows everything that Jesus knows. You have the mind of Christ. If we really believe that, we wouldn't sing these songs about further along, we'll know all about it. Further along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. Man, we can understand it right now. Man, I've got a great teaching on this. It takes about an hour and a half, but this is why you pray in tongues. When you pray in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14, 14 says, your spirit prays. When I say spirit, I'm pointing right here because in John chapter seven, it says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the spirit that they that believed upon him would receive. So your spirit, according to that scripture, is in your belly. Some of us look like we have more of the spirit than others, but it's not true, praise God. But when you pray in the spirit, you are praying when you pray in tongues, you are praying in the spirit, the part of you that has the mind of Christ and knows all things. And then 1 Corinthians 14, 13 says, if you pray in tongues, pray also that you interpret. So anytime you have a need, all you got to do is say, Father, thank you that I have an unction from you and I understand all things, not in your brain, but in your spirit. All I got to do is draw it out. How do I draw it out? When I pray in tongues, I'm praying in the spirit. And I'm going to pray that I interpret. So you start praying in tongues and ask God for an interpretation. And boy, God will start giving you wisdom. I could give you thousands and thousands of examples of how I've done this. When I need wisdom and I start praying in tongues and boom, God shows me something. Man, if you don't pray in tongues, it's like fighting the devil with both hands tied behind your back. You need to pray in tongues because it just really, it's like flipping a switch that turns on the spirit realm. It's powerful. When you pray in tongues, your mind is unfruitful is what it says. First Corinthians 14, 13. And if you are carnal and being controlled and dominated by your physical, natural realm, your mind, when you pray in tongues, it makes no sense to your brain for you to continue to pray in tongues. You've got to get into the spirit realm. And that's why it builds you up on your most holy faith. Praying in tongues is like finding the switch to the power of God and just flipping it and turning it on. And you can pray in tongues and pray that you interpret. I got a great teaching on that, about two hours worth of teaching. It's awesome. So anyway, your spirit is identical to him. And somebody says, well, I, I just don't believe, I don't believe that. Well, it says in Romans chapter eight, verse nine, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you say, I don't have that, well, then you aren't his. We'll give an invitation and you can be born again tonight. But if you are born again, whether you know it or not, your spirit is identical to Jesus. You know, if we really believe that, you would not settle for the substandard life that most Christians settle for. The reason most Christians, when the doctor says you're going to die and you just fall apart like a $2 suitcase is because you don't believe that you have the same spirit on the inside of you that raised Christ from the dead. And you say, but I'm only human. I'm not only human. One third of me is wall to wall Holy Ghost. One third of me is exactly like Christ. And because of it, I do not submit to stuff that's just normal. And I know many of you are thinking, that's weird. 
I think you're weird. I think you're weird to be a born again person and to be as he is, so are you. He that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit and yet you're going around having the same fear, the same uh, worries, the same care as people that don't know the Lord. Did you know when 2008, 2009 came along and they had the quote unquote great recession, Christians were just as fearful as believers. Now again, I know that Mac teaches a lot on prosperity and this group probably isn't quite typical, but I, I could just guarantee you, you can't get this many people in a church and have everybody on the same page. There are some of you that got to worrying and you planned on defeat and you started cutting back and fearing lack just the same as people that didn't know the Lord. That's wrong. God said he'd supply your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Our, our, uh, our standard is the riches in glory, not this earth economy. Amen. Did you know when the great recession happened is when the Lord told me I was thinking too small and I had to think bigger. And so right in the middle of the great recession, we started expanding and I just finished a $32 million building debt free. I've got a $53 million building that's halfway paid for uh, debt free. And we are, we are in the process of building like a $250 million campus above our normal expenses all during the great recession. We doubled our income in 2009 while everybody else was cutting back. And you know why? Because I, I'm not limited to what I see and feel. I'm going by what the Word of God says, who I am in Christ. It's wrong for you to fear and have the same phobias and the same problems that your neighbor that doesn't know the Lord has. There should be a difference between us and a person that's dead. And I'm saying this in love, but brothers and sisters, there's some of you that if you were arrested for being a Christian, there wouldn't be enough evidence to convict you. You have the same fear. You get the same sickness. You have the same financial problems. You have the same mindset as people that don't even know the Lord. And it's because, again, you're carnal. You are thinking only in the natural realm instead of seeing who you are in Christ. Once you see who you are in Christ and what you have, it just changes the way you do things. When the Lord showed me this, I was in the Baptist church and I had been told that miracles ceased with the apostles and that they didn't have miracles today. But once I saw these truths, did you know, I, I don't know how to explain it, but I knew that if I had the same power that raised Christ from the dead living on the inside of me, then miracles were still for us today. And I started praying and I saw people healed. I saw all kinds of miracles. And as far as I knew, it was the first miracle that had happened in 2000 years. I'd been told that they all quit. And yet I still believed in miracles before I heard of, I ever heard of Copenhagen, Copeland and Hagen. I'd never heard of them. And I saw miracles happen before I heard anybody else was doing it just because I found out who I was in Christ Jesus. And man, I started believing God and things started happening. Amen. Somebody might be saying, well, I can accept that when I got born again, that those things were true, but you don't understand, man, I've blown it. I've sinned and I've, I've corrupted it. And, and see, a lot of people think that when you sin falls short, that somehow or another it corrupts your spirit. Look at this verse over in Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to say some things right here that will blow you out of the water if you haven't heard this. But in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So all of these verses I've used, you were created in righteousness and true holiness. 
as Jesus is, so are you in this world. He that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit. You're identical, ounce for ounce, molecule for molecule. That happens at salvation. And then according to this verse, the moment you believe, you are sealed. You know, there's different types of seals. You can put a stamp, a seal of approval on something and show that it's been inspected. But there's also a seal that's talking about like when a woman cans preserves or something, you put it in a jar and then you seal it with paraffin or something so no airborne impurities can get in. This is talking about a seal. You are vacuum packed the moment you believe and the Holy Spirit seals, encases your spirit so that you are created righteous and truly holy and it never changes. Even if you sin, Sin will penetrate your body and it'll give Satan access to your body. Romans chapter 6 verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you yield to sin, you yield to the person who inspired that sin, Satan. And Satan, if you give him that kind of inroad, it says he only comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. If you yield to Satan through your sin, he will come into your physical body and eat your lunch and pop the bag. <laughs> you can tell our Bible college students, all of them know that. <laughs> but you don't want to yield to Satan because it'll give him access to your physical body and it'll give him access to your mind and your emotions. And you will suffer because of sin. But your spirit is sealed. It doesn't change your spirit. It doesn't penetrate the seal around your spirit. Your spirit retains its righteousness and holiness even when you sin. And because of this, God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is why you have to learn who you are in Christ. And when you approach God, you have to approach him based on who you are in Christ, not based on your actions. If you come and you are really bold and God, I know you're going to use me because I've been fasted and praying. I went to church and I gave big in the offering and I know you're going to bless me. You're approaching him in the flesh and you are unacceptable. That's right. But on the other hand, if you approach him in the spirit, you could have come and just sinned and you could still come boldly before the throne of grace if you approach him in spirit because your spirit isn't contaminated by your sin. It's not stained. Now, see, this is where some people take grace and they begin to start going to an extreme. Man, my spirit's saved. It's sealed. I can get by with anything. Well, first of all, the Bible says, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Beloved, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Verse 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And verse 3 says, And every man or woman, every person that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. If anybody is listening to me tonight and says, man, this is awesome. I can go live in sin. This is my ticket to go live for the devil. You need to get born again. Because if you had this hope in him, you aren't looking for an excuse to sin. You want to live for God. You might be doing a poor job of it because religion, law, will actually strengthen sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. It actually makes sin come alive. Romans chapter 7, I believe it's verse 9. The law will actually make you sin and it'll give sin dominion over you. Romans chapter 6 verse 14 says, Sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law but under grace. If you are under the law, you actually are empowering sin in your life. Grace will break the dominion of sin. So if anybody is taking what I'm saying and saying, man, this is awesome, I can go live in sin. You don't have this hope in you or you would purify yourself. Amen. I am not encouraging sin. I'm just saying that when you got born again, this righteousness and holiness and your position in Christ is not conditional. It doesn't fluctuate based on your performance. If it did... If you could corrupt your spirit, 
If you could defile your spirit through your actions, then you know what? The moment you got born again, I'd kill you. I might go to hell, but that's the only way you'd ever get to heaven is if I just killed you the moment you became holy and pure because I can guarantee you, you are going to mess up. And somebody said, well, but you get them all confessed. Do you really think that you've confessed everything? Some of you are thinking things about me right now that you don't even know are wrong, but you need to confess it. I'm your brother in the Lord, and you're thinking about things about me that... You know, don't please God, amen. <laughs> you, anyway. Man, you are sanctified and perfected forever. Forever. Let me share this with you. You need to read this out of your Bible or you wouldn't believe this is in the Bible. Look over in Hebrews chapter 9. I wish I had time to put this in its context. It's even more powerful if you understand the context of this. But in Hebrews chapter 9, it's contrasting the old covenant with the new covenant. Under the old covenant, every time a person sinned, it broke relationship with God and they had to offer a new sacrifice. But under the new covenant, that's not true. It's the opposite. And this is the point that he's making in Hebrews chapter 9. And in verse 12, it says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Again, if you take this in its context, it's showing under the old covenant, every time you sinned, you had to have a new offering for sin. You had to get that sin under the blood. You had to reapply the blood. You had to go through a cleansing process. But under this new covenant, he entered in once. If you were to study this, there are five times in this chapter that this contrast is made. The Old Testament was every time you sinned, you had to get re-cleansed. In the new covenant, once, once you were cleansed. And notice what it says, that you received eternal redemption. Did you know if words mean anything? This means you got eternal redemption. Not redemption till the next time you sinned. Eternal redemption. This is radical. This changed my life. This changed my life. Because even after I began to understand that, God, you did something special. You made me brand new. I was recreated. I thought, well, you gave me this precious gift. But, man, I've blown it. I've corrupted it. And I saw myself as somehow or another defiled and never quite where I was supposed to be. But once I started understanding that I was totally his workmanship... It didn't have anything to do with me. I was created righteous and truly holy. Once I began to understand this and then understand that I was sealed and that one sacrifice gave me eternal redemption, it changed my whole relationship with God. It didn't make me want to go sin more. It made me want to sin less. Because now, man, God had given me such a great gift. I don't want to go out here and not enjoy it by yielding myself to the devil. Now, I'll say some things here that most pastors won't say. I'm sure Pastor Lynn and uh, Mac will love me anyway. But did you know what? If you never came to church again, God would love you the same. Most people believe I've got to go to church and do all this. No, you don't. God loves you based on who you are in the Spirit. But... If you don't go to church, you're stupid. It's not that God doesn't love you. It's just that you're stupid because you aren't going to hear somebody telling you this good news. You're going to be sitting there watching as the stomach turns on the television and listening to stuff that pollutes you. You need to come here for your edification. Coming to church changes your heart towards God. It doesn't change God's heart towards you. So if you never came to church again, and if you were truly born again, God would love you the same. But you're stupid. 
but I'm trying to say, God loves you, stupid. God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't make God love you more, and you can't make God love you less. But there's a lot of stuff you can do that'll make you love God less. You go out and yield to sin and don't get around believers and don't study the word and don't pray. You won't love God the same. And you're just stupid if you do that. But God loves you, stupid. He loves you the same. Your spirit is just the same. But it's just wrong. Why would you want to do that? If anybody really understood, if you had, a, if you had a, even a glimpse of what Jesus has done for you, you would be so excited, so in love with him that you'd give up bubble gum if you thought it would please him. Man, you'll do anything. People that are sitting there saying, well, what can I get by with? You don't know what Jesus has done for you. Man, I'm not trying to see what I can get by with. There's a lot of things I could do, but I don't want to do them. Man, I want to live for God. So by one offering... He gave you eternal redemption. In verse 15, it says, And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. They which, which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Eternal inheritance. If words mean anything, what part of eternal inheritance do we not understand? And yet we've been taught that we are forgiven up until the next sin. And then you got to get that sin confessed and under the blood. And if you don't, you can die and go to hell. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> Somebody's sitting here, so you're one of those once saved, always saved guys. Not exactly. I believe that you can renounce your salvation. I don't believe you can send it away. If you can send it away, tell me which sin is it that would qualify? Well, you have to start saying there's certain sins that are acceptable and certain that aren't. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 10, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. If you're going to say that sin can send you to hell, well then any sin could send you to hell. That's not what this is teaching. Your sins have been forgiven. You don't lose your salvation because of sin. You could renounce it one time, Hebrews chapter 6. I'm sorry to even mention this because I hadn't got time to explain it. But this is what Hagen taught. You can renounce your salvation one time, but if you do, there is no such thing as repentance. And only a mature Christian can do that. An immature Christian can't do it. But you can't sin your salvation away. Your sins, you got eternal redemption, eternal inheritance. It's eternal. A person that believes every time you sin, you lose everything that God has done in your life. There's no way you're ever going to mature. You're never going to go anywhere because you're going to blow it all the time. Sin is not only what you're supposed to do, or excuse me, sin is not only these commandments that you can't do things, but it says in Romans 14, 23, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Or excuse me, I think that's James 4, 17. Romans 14, 23 says, uh, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You take either one of those verses and I guarantee you, there's times that all of us aren't in faith. There's times that we don't do the good that we're supposed to do. All of us sin constantly. And if you think that you lose your right standing with God every time you sin, then you are going to be one messed up person that has no confidence, no boldness, because your own conscience is going to be condemning you constantly. It changes everything when you understand that this is talking about your spirit. Your spirit was cleansed, created in righteousness and true holiness. It's identical to Jesus. It's one with him, and then it's vacuum-packed, sealed. And when you sin, sin will give Satan an inroad into your physical body and into your soulish realm, but it doesn't penetrate the seal around your spirit, and you still have access to the throne room if you will worship him in spirit. And in truth, 
And instead of running from God and feeling so unworthy, you can run right into the very throne room of God and say, oh God, I blew it. The devil's on my case. I'm the one that gave him the opportunity, but thank you for your forgiveness. And you can boldly go in there instead of being separated. Amen. Again, I wish I had time to go through all of these verses, but you read it down here in verses 24 through the end of the chapter. It just makes this thing that the priests go in all of the time and are offering sacrifices. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Jesus is not in heaven reapplying the blood every time you sin and trying to get your sin under the blood. Can you imagine how many millions of Christians there are around the world that sin every single day, multiple times every single day, and every single day, oh God, I've sinned, please get this sin under the blood. Jesus would have to be, there'd be no seating at the right hand of the Father. He would be standing, working 24 hours a day, amen, purging everybody's sin. Jesus offered one sacrifice for sins forever, and he's now seated at the Father's right hand. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. For the law having a good a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there into perfect. Again, he's continuing this comparison. The Old Testament didn't ever cleanse anybody. It was only symbolic. And, it, and that's the reason they had to offer those sacrifices over and over because they were only types and shadows. It wasn't the real deal. In verse 2, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? If the sacrifices in the Old Testament would have really purged anything, they'd have quit offering them. But they kept offering them over and over and over. It says, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. The Old Testament sacrifices couldn't do it because they were only types and shadows. But the New Testament sacrifice of Jesus did do it and because of it, you should have no more conscience of sin. You should not be sin conscious. That's nearly heresy to the average Christian. The average Christian thinks that being sin conscious and unworthy conscious and, oh God, we are so unworthy. We come before you so humbly. We don't deserve anything. We think that that's actually a godly thing. You know, if you feel, I heard Kenneth Copeland say this, if you feel like a gnat on the back of an elephant when you come before God, instead of talking about how sorry and puny you are, talk about how big God is to love somebody as sorry and puny as you, amen? <laughs> But see, we will just sit here and focus on our sin and our failure and, oh, God, all of these things. Man, you ought to focus on God. You are so awesome to accept somebody like me, to give me eternal redemption, eternal inheritance. And you should not be focused on your sin, but instead focused on the one who has forgiven you of all of your sin. Take a deep breath. He's forgiven you of all sin, past, present, and even future sin. Sin that you hadn't even committed yet have already been forgiven. And somebody says, somebody says, how can God forgive a sin before I commit it? Well, you better hope that he can because he only died for your sins one time 2,000 years ago before you ever committed them. I don't know how God does it, but he forgave all of your sins, past, present, and even sins that you haven't committed yet are forgiven. You know, my sister, she's nine years older than me, and she's a, she's a great lady. She saw a person raised from the dead in the back of her car one time, choked on gum, and died. My sister raised her from the dead. She knows the Lord, but she has a daughter that could make any believer cuss. <laughs> she is the most rebellious, one of the most rebellious kids I've ever seen. And anyway, when she was a kid, she's 12 or 13, my sister was fixing supper. Her husband was a professor at Oklahoma Baptist University, and so he was bringing somebody over, and my sister was fixing supper. She was busy in the kitchen. And my niece was just ragging on her and giving her a hard time and saying bad stuff. And, and anyway, 
Long story, but my sister just lost her temper and decked her daughter, <laughs> knocked her flat of her back. And after she did it, she ran upstairs, threw herself across the bed, and she said, God, you've got to speak to me. If I start crying, I won't come out of here until tomorrow morning. I've got to have a word. I've got to fix supper. I've got to somehow or another get over this. And the Lord just spoke to her and he said, Joyce, when you got born again at eight years old, I knew you were going to do this. I've already forgiven you. It's okay. And you know what that did? That didn't make her go down and slap her daughter again, because after all, it's forgiven. No, but it enabled her to deal with it. And she went down and asked her daughter to forgive her, and she was able to finish supper and go ahead. But see, there, most people believe that every time you sin, somehow or another, this is a new infraction between you and God, and like, how could God love me after I did this? When you came to him, he knew every rotten thing you would ever do, and he forgave you of all sin, past, present, and even the sins you hadn't committed yet. They were all atoned for. They're all under the blood. So Hebrews chapter 10 talks about that, that God put into effect a last will and testament. And look at this in verse 10. It says, by the which will we are sanctified. The word sanctified means to set apart or to make holy. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once. You are sanctified, made holy once. Not every time you sin. Once. Once for all. Some people have said, well, that means once for all people, not once for all time. Well, let's just keep reading and I'll show you. It means once for all time. In verse 11, it again makes this same contrast. The Old Testament, every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. This isn't talking about just one sacrifice for everybody, but one sacrifice forever. The Lord does not have to re-save you, reapply His blood. You don't lose your right standing with God with, when you sin because it was your spirit that was made in right standing with God. It's your spirit that was created in righteousness and true holiness. Then it's vacuum packed, sealed by the Holy Spirit and because of this, God is a spirit. God is looking at you in the spirit and you can come before him in spirit and in truth and worship him even when you have sinned and blown it. And the only reason that we don't benefit from this is because we don't know the truth. The truth sets us free and our conscience gets defiled and you are condemning yourself. With most of us, it's not even the devil condemning us. He taught us how to condemn ourselves, and then we're doing a bang-up job. He can go on vacation. <laughs> You're just condemning yourself. But it says that he offered this one sacrifice for sins forever, and now he is set down at the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, notice again, one offering, not many offerings, not every time you sin offering, but by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Verse 10 says you were sanctified by the offering of Jesus Christ once for all. And verse 14 says if you were sanctified, you are perfected forever. Is that talking about your physical body? No, your physical body is not perfect. This corruptible must put on incorruption. Is that talking about your mind? No, your mind, your emotions, your uh, feelings are not perfect. They fluctuate and you, you have messed up and you will mess up again. But in your spirit, you have been sanctified and perfected forever. Your spirit is as perfect and pure right this moment as it will be a million years from now in eternity. Your spirit is not going to have to be dusted off, cleansed, injected with some of the power of God, somehow or another cleansed from defilement. Your spirit is perfect right now. 
There's so many scriptures that say this, but right here's one of them. You've been sanctified and perfected forever. Your spirit's as perfect right now as it will ever be. The problem in the Christian life isn't your spirit. You don't need to get the word into your spirit. Your spirit has the mind of Christ. It has an unction from the Holy One and knows all things. I'm trying to get the word into your little peanut brain. It's through the renewing of your mind that the power of God is released. Your spirit is perfect. But our mind is like a valve. You know, Mac, uh, Mac has used this illustration a couple of times about turning the valve. This is something I use. If you could right now imagine a pipe over my head. And over here is the Spirit. And in the Spirit, you're sanctified and perfected forever. You're as holy and pure as Jesus is. You have His mind, His wisdom, His faith, His power, love, joy, and peace. Everything that you could ever want, anything that Jesus purchased is in the Spirit over here. And here's the spigot where it comes out. But your mind is the valve. Your mind is the thing that controls it. And if you are sitting here feeling unworthy and, oh, God, I know you can do anything, but you have done nothing, but you could do it. <laughs> and if I would live holy and if I will pray and if I will fast, then maybe you will see your mind just shut off the flow of the Spirit of God. You could have all of this life of God in the Spirit and not one drop of it comes out into your physical body because of stinking thinking. And your thinking just closes the valve. But when you begin to understand who you are in Christ and that, Father, I don't, I don't need you to come and break through the heavenlies. You're already inside of me. Yes. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead already lives on the inside of me. It's not out there. It's here. The supernatural, miraculous healing power of God is inches away from the cancer that's killing you. But it's, to get out, it's got to come through your brain. It's got to come through the way you think. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. You got to get your mind renewed and quit thinking that, oh God, would you please move? Am I holy? Uh, God, would you please cleanse me of this? And you've got to become worthy. Your spirit was just created in righteousness and holiness. You've already got it. And as quickly as you can renew your mind, you can turn that valve and release this supernatural power of God. But if you're out living in sin, sin corrupts your mind. Sin keeps you from believing. Sin will make you stupid. Sin is stupid. It's stupid to live in sin. It's brain dead. I mean, how dumb can you get and still breathe? Just to go out and live in sin is crazy. Look over in uh, Hebrews chapter 12. This will show you. See, some people still struggle and they say, I'm not perfect. Why? Because you go look in the mirror and you see all kinds of imperfections. You search your mind and you just see failure after failure and weakness after weakness. And you think, how can this be? It's because you're carnal. You're trying to find it in the carnal realm. It's the spirit part of you that is perfect. And right here, it proves it. Remember that this is the same author that is writing. Men put the chapter and verse divisions in here so for our reference sake. There's nothing wrong with that. But this isn't a new thought. It's not a new chapter. I mean, it's a new chapter according to our divisions, but it's, he's not saying anything new. This is the same guy talking. It's the same context. And look at what he says right here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. But you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. This just tells you real clearly what he's talking about. It's the spirit that was made perfect. Your body's not perfect. You got to get a new body. We've got a glorified body coming. Your soul's not perfect. Paul said over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that we only know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then we will know all things, even as also we are known. Your soul's not perfect yet, but your little spirit is perfect. It's identical to Jesus. It's as pure and holy as Jesus is. It has his righteousness, his power, Therefore, when you come before the Lord and say, in the name of Jesus, and you step into the spirit, 
You have as much authority as Jesus has. You have as much power as Jesus has. You have access to all of his wisdom and his ability. And you've got to get rid of this mindset that, well, that was Jesus and this is me. I can't relate. Uh, Jesus healed everybody and Jesus did miracles, but who am I? If you are born again, you are identical to Jesus in your spirit. As Jesus is, so are you in this world. This is why he said in John chapter 14, verse 12, he says, verily, verily, that means truly, truly. Everything Jesus said was the truth. When he had to qualify it by saying, I'm telling you the truth, I'm telling you the truth, it was because he was about to say something that was beyond human belief and he had to qualify. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. If you believe on him, you've got the same power on the inside of you. It's not out there someplace that you got to pray it down somehow or another, become worthy and earn it, gain it. It's already in you. Are you going to acknowledge it and release it? Philemon chapter one, verse six, Paul prayed a prayer for Philemon, his friend. And he says, I pray that the communication of your faith become effectual. The word effectual means it begins to work by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. He didn't pray like we pray. Oh God, please give me more power. Oh God, pour out your anointing. Double portion. <laughs> you know what? Elisha had a double portion of Elijah, but that's because neither one of them had the fullness of the Spirit. You can't get a double portion. You got the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you bodily. You are identical to Jesus and there isn't any double portion night for a New Testament believer. Now in a sense, you could get twice as much Thank you.